Hello, friends. This is Dave Hurwitz, executive editor at ClassicsToday.com, here with the most important recording projects ever in the history of humanity. Oh, yeah, at least in the world of classical music. Now, when I announced that we were doing this series, a lot of you got very excited. And those of you who know what the most recording important recording projects are, um, immediately started making lists of them. And you so well, I mean, you know, who am I to argue? You were right. You know what they are. You know, the connoisseurs have a sense of what's going to appear in this series, or a lot of it, not everything, mind you. There may be some surprises. There's a little bit of leeway here. But still, uh, you know, there's a remarkable consensus about what these are. And so I want to remind those of you who sort of know that there are going to be many, many more people who have no idea what these are. This will be new. This will be an introduction. And it's to those people to whom I'm speaking, because, you know, there are, we, we tend to think because there's so much stuff out there. It's all subjective. It's all this. It's all that. You know, it's all whatever you want. It's all opinion. And it's all, the, listen, that's all true. The subjectivity is out there. But we are talking about historical fact when we do these talks. And, and you know, the historical facts, the, I mean, there's a general consensus about a lot of stuff in the world of classical music about things that really mattered or that really represented a milestone in the history of recordings in terms of repertoire. This is about composers and works, not about artists and the huge boxes devoted to them that are popping up like toadstools throughout the classical music industry. So uh, the next in our list, this is number two in this series. The first was the Schulte Ring, Wagner's Ring der Nibelungen, which was a huge deal. But we're going to the other end of the spectrum now with, ta-da, Scott Ross's Complete Scarlatti Sonatas, which a couple of you have already mentioned, and rightly so. This was an amazing achievement. Unbelievable achievement. But let's let's talk a little bit of background, shall we? Uh, you know, Scarlatti was a composer who was known in the history books um, as some crazy Italian guy, the son of Alessandro Scarlatti, who invented the Baroque cantata and many other things, um, and who escaped from his father's rather, rather pushy tutelage in Italy uh, to Spain, from whence he became the harpsichord teacher of the Infanta Maria Barbara, who was married to, what's his name? I'm from Charles II. I don't know, one of those guys, the disgusting king of Spain who never bathed. And, and he wrote 555 little keyboard sonatas, they were called. He called them, you know, exercises, or they, they could be called all kinds of things. But basically, now we call them sonatas. Um, and each in binary form, for the most part. They're not all the same, but most, you know, 99% of them are, 95% of them, whatever. That is two halves, both repeated, um, lasting anywhere from a minute to 10 minutes. And they are extraordinary works. And we all sort of said, oh yeah, they're extraordinary. But no, and listen to them, of course, because there's 555 of them. And the only way you could really get to know them was to play them yourself. And as with so much Baroque music, music of that period, it was impossible to play them yourself unless you were a, you know, a, a, a historian of the keyboard literature who could go to a library and find some sort of manuscript facsimile or something of the music. Only 33 of them were printed in, or 30, something like that, in Scarlatti's lifetime. And all the rest of them were in manuscript. And it wasn't until the 1950s when, you know, a couple of scholars like Longo or Ralph Kirkpatrick got their hands on them and started issuing scholarly critical editions that it was even possible to perform all of them. So these things were all composed in the 1700s, the early 1700s, the first decades of the 1700s or so. And it wasn't until the 1950s that other than a few sort of famous ones that circulated, keyboard artists could actually perform them and, you know, in, in clumps, in groups. And aside from, aside from that, we also had to have the period instrument movement and the revival of the harpsichord as a valid performance instrument, because before then, all of the performances of this music were on the modern piano. Now, don't get me wrong. These pieces sound splendid on the piano. 
They really do. You could do wonderful things on the piano. And, and Vladimir Horowitz, there were great, great pianists who, who performed these things, you know, very, very well. Um, but they were novelties. And they weren't going to do a scholarly survey of big heaps of them. They were encore pieces and little bonbons. You know, you were never going to get the kind of devoted attention to the music until we had great harpsichordists. And Scott Ross um, was one of them. Um, he died very sadly of AIDS at a young age. And uh, he was a tremendous harpsichord player, a very gifted artist um, who was based mainly in France. And he did, besides Scarlatti, he did you know, a lot of other harpsichord people, things like Bach and you know other things like that. But the other thing about Scarlatti sonatas is they really were written for the harpsichord and sound best on that instrument. Now, don't get me wrong here. I'm not suggesting that you run out and listen to 555 of these. I mean, I have, I did a road music video where I played Scarlatti sonatas, and they are so energetic, and so full of 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 explosive vitality. Yes, there are some quiet ones, and there are some slower ones, but for the most part, I mean, they're just like it's like fireworks going off constantly. And I was playing, you know, a, a whole slew of them. I decided to do nothing but Scarlatti sonatas on my ride back from Connecticut to Brooklyn. And by the time I got to the Whitestone Bridge, I was ready to drive off the bridge. I mean, I was just going faster and faster and faster. I mean, they just keep you at, at this level of energy up here or somewhere. And there's only so much of them that you can take at any one time. So, so there's no necessity to listen to all of them at once. But this was an incredible project, not just to perform all of them, but to perform all of them so well with such insight on multiple instruments. And Scott Ross wrote an amazing booklet to go with this series in its original incarnation. This is the lower priced reissue thing here on 34 CDs. Um, and I have the original one still sitting up there. It's, it's up there somewhere. Um, I have no idea what happened to that original book. And I'm really annoyed with it because it listed all of the criteria, the, the motives, the ideas that permeate these sonatas and had it sort of a table. So with each sonata, you got a description of the sonata, all 555 of them, and then a little chart that said, okay, repeated note figurations, Spanish music, military fanfare imitations. You know, you could see exactly what elements went into that particular sonata. It was a wonderful work. It should be published separately. And stupidly, when Erato issued this thing, it was in, I'm looking at it, it's right up there. That's why I keep going, doing like this. It's right up there. It was a long box, you know, about like yay long in, in sets of like four discs and jewel boxes. That booklet didn't fit in the, in the normal container. It should have slid right into the top of it, but it didn't. And so what you got was the shrink wrap thing with the book on top of it, just so that it could be detachable and get lost. It was also not printed on acid-free paper. So it turned sort of yellow and brown and got crunchy and disgusting. Hence, um, I no longer have it. At least if I do, I don't know where it is. Um, it may be somewhere, but it was. It, it, it's just a shame because it was a fabulous, fabulous, complete series. Now all we have is the music itself. And you know what? That's not such a bad thing either. I mean, you get this whole deal. You do get a little booky, little tiny slender booklet here. But that's not the point. The point is that Scarlatti's reputation was something that most people took on faith. It wasn't something that we had the opportunity to encounter for ourselves. And his unbelievable originality and consistently high level of invention, his genius, was something we just, we just said, okay, he was old, he's dead, he's classical, therefore, um, it has a certain quality. He was, he was sort of, you know, coming along on the coattails of the idea of classical music. But now we had the opportunity for the first time to listen to the whole shebangy, if we were so inclined. And, you know, even if you didn't listen to all 555 of these little suckers, you know, you would dip in here and there. And anywhere you dipped, you got gold. And that was the point. All of a sudden, there was this, this, this boundless, boundless resource of extraordinary music that you could just pick out something at random anytime you felt like a little, you know, harpsichord tinkling in the background or foreground. And, and, and you'd be 
riveted, absolutely captivated by this extraordinary music, this genius who was all alone in Spain with Maria Barbara and her, her smelly, stinky, disgusting husband. And she, he was writing these pieces for her to amuse herself in what must have been a rather desultory life in many respects. And then Scott Ross came along and did it all. And, and like so many um, rescue missions that the period instrument movement has performed, um, it turned out to be just wonderful. We began to realize just how much great music there is out there. But the fact that there's so much great music out there has also undermined the, the pillars, the foundations of what it is to be classical. Because one of the things that makes something classical is scarcity, rarity. And when the repertoire consisted of just a few things that we sort of knew and the rest that we took on faith, everybody had a community of knowledge where we all knew the same works and we all knew the same recordings and we all knew what was out there. And we said, oh, these are the classics. And it was, it was manageable. You could wrap your brain around it. But then you start finding these 30 disc series, 40 disc series, 100 disc series of tons and tons and tons of music, most of which nobody ever listened to or had to listen to. And all of a sudden we were supposed to listen to it. And it's all going, what does that mean anymore? What are our criteria for what, what makes something a classic, for what makes music great? All of those things have come into question and caused this sort of fabulously mixed up cholent of, of, of insanity in which we live now. And so, yeah, this was incredible, but it was incredible for a lot of reasons, not just for, the, for itself, but also for what it meant for how we experience and listen to music, because who can reasonably be expected to listen to 34 discs of little, you know, several minute harpsichord sonatas? How many at a time? What are you gonna do with them? Is it just a doorstop or are you actually gonna perform it? Well, that's up to you. I, for one, am just happy that we have the opportunity. So keep on listening, friends. Thanks so much for joining me. Take care.